After uh, history taking, you have to go for examination. Now we are discussing the examination of ear. So uh, before going to any system examination, general examination is important. Don't forget that. General examination. Okay. We are examining the patient from head to toe. We have to start from the built of the patient. Whether it is ill built, moderately built or well built. Then look for any uterus, cyanosis, jaundice. Same, you have practicing in your medicine and surgery. And in ENT also, never forget to mention about the general examination. And also take the blood pressure and uh, pulse rate. And in uh, ENT, the, especially in cases of uh, allergic rhinitis and in uh, ethmoid polyposis, nasal polyposis, look the skin over the uh, face for allergic markers like an allergic salute uh, or any eyelash signs or uh, discoloration of the skin over the face and also look for dermatitis especially over the skin over the shin, over the shin, okay for any dermatitis or pyoderma or any skin rashes. They can happen along with allergic rhinitis or especially in cases of uh, uh, nasal polyposis. Okay, so general examination should be done before going to any system examination. Examination of ear, nose and throat is different from examination of all other parts of the body. So what is the difference? This uh, small size and anatomical inaccessibility makes it uh, different from all other parts. You cannot examine the ear or the nose or the uh, throat as to examine that uh, uh, abdomen or your limbs. So we need special instruments and uh, good illumination for examination of ENT. Okay, right? So we need good illumination and special instruments for examination of ENT. Let us see what are the uh, illumination system needed for uh, examination of ear. The illumination system or the source of light can be a conventional bull's eye lamp or it, we can also use a headlight. So this bull's eye lamp is kept behind the uh, left, left shoulder of the patient at the level of left ear. This is the uh, bull's eye lamp which is kept at the level behind the left shoulder of the patient at the level of the left ear and uh, it contains a convex lens with an 100 watt bulb and the light from it converges to the uh, head mirror and again uh, 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 converges on the part to be examined. Regarding bull's eye lamp you should remember we use 100 watt bulbs, bulb that is uh, important because when you sta uh, start your own clinic, uh, if the attendant will come and put a 40, deep, uh, 40 watts bulb, you should tell it is not 40 by 100, right? Don't forget that. And uh, this is the uh, head mirror. Okay, we keep it like this, head mirror. And this is a concave mirror with an outer diameter of uh, 9 centimeters. And it has got an inner aperture that is 2 cm diameter, outer 9 and inner 2 with a focal length of 25 cm. So what is the importance of this 25 cm? You have to sit in a range of 25 cm from the patient. Otherwise this will not go and illuminate the patient. So the light from the 100 watt bulb of the bull's eye lamp come and uh, focus on this from a convex so the convex lens will converge the converged light will come here and this is a concave mirror again it will converge and the light will go and fall on the patient ear or nose or throat okay so uh, outer 9 centimeters inner aperture of 2 centimeter and a focal length of 25 centimeters and this inner aperture is because we have to uh, keep it in front of your right eye or your left eye whatever whichever I uh, you prefer that is your preference I prefer my right eye and otherwise what happened we have to close one eye and look so you have to learn looking through this hole so that we can use our both eyes 
it's not so easy you have to, at least you have to uh, use uh, this for at least examining 10 patients then only you will uh, study to use this okay so that is McKenzie's head mirror uh, this outer diameter inner diameter and focal length can be asked in exam okay the other uh, instruments needed for ear examination are uh, ear speculums of different sizes see there are different sizes and we prefer the largest size speculum which can be conveniently inserted into the external auditory canal, right? The largest speculum that can be conveniently inserted without resistance, without injury, the external auditory canal. And we also use a otoscope and this otoscope has a, a 2x magnification for seeing the tympanic membrane. And uh, along with this, pneumatic bulb can be uh, attached this is to find out the mobility of the tympanic membrane and also to uh, find out the difference between a retraction pocket or a, a perforation. There are so many uses of this uh, speculum that I will uh, tell you along with the examination of tympanic membrane. So uh, regarding the ear speculum, the largest size speculum which can be conveniently uh, without resistance inserted into the external artery canal is preferred. Just we have to hold it like this. The instrument is gently inserted into the external artery canal with a little finger we have to support the uh, support near the auricular region. Bullseye lamp and the head mirror are used for illumination along with ear speculum of different sizes and otoscope with pneumatic bulb and tuning forks of different frequencies are used for examination of the ear. So the first in, uh, first in the ear examination comes the uh, examination of pinna. So thorough knowledge of the anatomy of the external ear and tympanic membrane is very essential for examination. If you have any doubt, just go to my previous class on anatomy of external ear and tympanic membrane and then come back and see this. Okay? So the pinna uh, size, there can be changes in the size like a microtia or a macrotia. Then in the shape, example changes in shape due to trauma, a cauliflower ear or a, a Singapore ear etc. And regarding the position, there can be mainly uh, noticeable variations are seen. One is outward and downward displacement of the pinna in mastoiditis with a superior steel abscess. And this pinna stands out prominently with the obliteration of the, this one is a postural groove. So, stands out prominently with the obliteration of the postural groove in a uh, postauricular pharyngulosis. Okay, pharyngal. Then the color change, what is the color change? You can, uh, common color change is the redness seen in infections, abscess, pharyngal. Then swellings, swellings can be any swelling, can be a cystic swelling or uh, can be a hematoma. Uh, then scar, what are the two uh, common scar seen in relation to the pinna? One is a postural scar, okay. This I have discussed along with anatomy also. So this is in the postural region. You can see a scar from the upper attachment of pinna up to the tip of mastoid. This is a postural William Wild. Right? And then another one is an endoral. So uh, that That is seen in uh, incisura terminalis, this area. Lombard's endoral incision. So this Lombard endoral in the uh, incisura terminalis uh, extending to the preauricular area and posteriorly another uh, common scar is a posteroral William Wilde incision. Okay. Then hairy tragus 
uh, with the pinna and earlobe crease. This has got an association with one disease. It is an established association. It is an established observation. What is that disease? Hairy tragus, pinna and an earlobe crease commonly seen in patients with the coronary artery diseases. In most of the cases, the pinna will be normal. There won't be any change in the size, shape or all these parts will be normal. So, you have to write it as normal only. If the pinna is normal, write it as normal. And don't write it as size normal, shape normal, uh, no color change, position normal. No need to uh, write like that. Uh, ideally, you, in examination of ear, you have to write as right and left and start by writing or uh, uh, numerically writing all the examination parts. If the pinna is normal, write it as normal on right and left. Uh, it's a common observation that students write as size normal, shape normal, no ear lobe crease. No need to write like this. If the ear is uh, pinna normal or external artery canal normal or the tympanic membrane normal, just write it as normal only. If there is any abnormality, you note down the point during the examination. Okay. After pinna comes the pre-auricular area and the post-auricular area. In the pre-auricular area, uh, commonly what are things? One is the pre-auricular sinus can be seen. Pre-auricular tag, there will be cyst or lipoma or swellings. Anything can be seen. If everything is normal, you write it as a normal pre-auricular area and examine both sides, both right and left. And in the post-auricular area, mainly there are scar. I will told uh, which scar is uh, commonly seen in a uh, post-auricular area. That is a post-oral William Bile sensation. Then there are two signs in relation to the post-oral area. One is a battle sign. Battle sign is a uh, bluish discoloration in the mastoid area seen in a fractures of the temporal bone that is ecchymosis of the uh, mastoid area seen in temporal bone fractures and another one is a Griesinger sign and what is this Griesinger sign? it's the edema seen at the uh, uh, Mastered emissary vein, edema and uh, tenderness at the area of the mastered emissary vein in the postural area. And that is seen in a lateral sinus thrombosis. So, this look for these two signs. One is in a fracture uh, temporal bone, which is seen in, uh, which is called as a battle sign. And uh, Griesinger sign is seen in lateral sinus thrombosis. External auditory canal is never a straight tube. It is an H-shaped tube of around 24 millimeters in uh, length and the hair in the outer cartilaginous part of the external artery canal may prevent proper visualization. So, in an adult, pull the pinna upwards, backwards and laterally. With your uh, one uh, fing uh, hand, pull the pinna upwards, backwards and laterally and with the index finger of the opposite hand, just retract the preauricular area or the tragus anteriorly. Okay, like this you have to. So in adult you have to uh, pull the pinna upwards, backwards and laterally. And in children downwards, backwards and laterally. And also with the uh, index finger of the opposite hand just retract the uh, tragus uh, medially. Okay. External artery canal and sometimes there will be debris or uh, uh, wax or uh, discharge in the external artery canal. If there is any discharge in the external artery canal you have to dry move the uh, discharge and if there is wax obstructing the view then you have to remove the wax also. And in uh, common abnormality seen in one is uh, uh, presence of swellings like osteoma or a, a sebaceous cyst or pharyngeal in the outer canal, osteomas in the bony canal or there can be canal, external artery canal stenosis 
especially in children and uh, there will be sagging of the posterior superior canal wall in case of acute mastoiditis also all this you have to look and if everything is normal as usual right is normal okay and on both side both right as well as on left side and uh, two uh, tenderness you have to elicit one is a triangle tenderness and another one is mastoid tenderness triangle sign is uh, presence of pain on pressing the tragus you know what is a tragus so just press the tragus and if there is a pain it is triangle sign is positive the usual fault the students are doing is number one you will just press the tragus and even a normal ear patient will uh, wins with pain so don't do that don't give over pressure and some students will do just they will rub over the tragus that also won't work out so give an adequate pressure over the tragus to elicit uh, pain and another mistake commonly seen is we will press over the tragus and we will ask the patient whether you know is there is any pain you will ask it is a sign you have to elicit that it is not a symptom so you if there is tragus sign is positive there is no need to ask the patient the patient will wince with pain there will be a facial expression there will be a expression of pain over the face of the patient so that is that you have to be careful in uh, doing a tragal sign okay so that is elicitation of tragal sign then mastoid tenderness it is elicited by the three finger test it is three finger test it doesn't mean that you have to press over these three points simultaneously never do that one is at the simba conga simba conga and second one is at the tip of mastoid and the third point is the uh, non hair hair area non hair area uh, posterior to the pinna that comes around the lateral surface of mastoid so one is at the simba conga and the second at the tip of mastoid and the third is the non hairy area posterior to the pinna okay this three point and the most reliable point is the simba conga uh, most reliable point for eliciting the mastoid tenderness is simba conga because it directly overlies the mastoid antrum for anatomical location of the simba conga and other areas please refer my class on uh, anatomy of external ear okay so that is regarding the mastoid tenderness ideally this tragal sign and elicitation of mastoid tenderness should be done at the end of examination because if you are uh, making pain on the patient sometime the patient may become uncooperative so better you do this uh, elicitation of tenderness and the fistula test at the end of examination okay but uh, during writing write it after external artery canal right next is the uh, examination of tympanic membrane so uh, if the external artery canal is narrow or it is too hairy then you will not be able to uh, see the tympanic membrane even if you pull the pinna upwards backwards and laterally so in that cases you have to use an ear speculum you can use hartman's uh, ear speculum and uh, examine the tympanic membrane first and after that go for an otoscopy or uh, autoendoscopy okay so in the tympanic membrane a normal tympanic membrane is discussed uh, is described as pearly white semi transparent with a cone of light in the andro inferior quadrant that is pearly white semi transparent with a cone of light in the andro inferior quadrant so how to divide the tympanic membrane into uh, pars tensa and pars flaccida and again how to divide the pars flaccida into four quadrants are given in my class on anatomy of tympanic membrane so here i will discuss only about the abnormalities okay the most common uh, abnormality or the commonest abnormality of the tympanic membrane is a retraction what is retraction so uh, if this is my tympanic membrane and this is a lateral external artery canal and this is a middle ear okay 
So uh, ideally the pressure on the both side of the tympanic membrane should be equal. And the middle ear get an aeration with the, uh, from the eustachian tube. Right? And here comes the handle of malleus like this. Okay. So if due to any reason the eustachian tube is not working properly. So what happens? This middle ear become negative pressure and this will suck the tympanic membrane inside. So it is negative. So this will suck the tympanic membrane inside. So what happens? This will go inside. Isn't it? So the tympanic membrane, if you are looking from uh, lateral aspect, the tympanic membrane, it was like this and this will go like this. So what are the features of a retracted tympanic membrane? So one, it will be dull and lusterless. So the normal architecture, normal anatomy is lost. So number one, it is dull and lusterless. Dull, lusterless. Okay. And the uh, angle between the incident rays and the reflected rays are lost. So what will happen? They will be absent or distorted cone of light. What is distorted cone of light? So normally, your, this is your cone of light. So any distortion or any change from the normal uh, anatomy is distortion. So this can be either you can see it like this. A small area of cone of light will be seen at the uh, near the umbo. Okay. Sometimes you can see a cone of light reflex at the towards the annulus. Or sometimes this will be an interrupted cone of light. All are called as distorted cone of light. So it can be either absent or a distorted cone of light. Then what happens? Here I have said this, this is a handle of malleus. It goes along with the because this uh, handle of malleus is uh, engulfed between the uh, middle and the inner layers of the tympanic membrane. This handle of malleus will also go along with the uh, tympanic membrane towards the middle layer. Right? So what will be, uh, uh, how will you see that? So there will be a force shortening or apparent shortening of the handle of malleus. Ideally the handle of malleus should be like this but it goes along with the uh, tympanic membrane in towards the uh, middle ear. There will be an apparent shortening of the uh, handle of malleus. So it is called foreshortening. Foreshortening of handle of malleus. Okay. And what are the other features? Only the tympanic membrane uh, fibers will go into the middle ear. All the uh, landmarks will be there. So all the landmarks will be prominent. So what are the uh, landmarks? Prominent landmarks. So what are the uh, landmarks? There will be anterior and posterior. So the anterior and posterior malleola folds. Then the lateral process, the annulus, all these will be uh, will be prominent. Okay. And because of all this, and also the mobility will be diminished. Okay. There will be slight uh, reduction, slight to more, um, moderate, mild to moderate reduction in the uh, mobility also. Okay. There will be uh, minimal reduction in the mobility also. Because of that, there will be a mild conductive hearing loss. So, the features of a retracted tympanic membrane are dull and lusterless, absent or distorted cone of light, foreshortening of the handle of malleus or the apparent shortening of the handle of malleus and all the landmarks will be prominent and there will be reduction in the mobility of the tympanic membrane leading to a mild conductive hearing loss. And uh, if you uh, see a retracted tympanic membrane, always look for the mobility of the tympanic membrane. Either by use doing the Valsalva maneuver or using a Seagull speculum. Okay, Seagull's pneumatic bulb and a speculum. So in all cases of retraction, look for mobility so that you can grade the retraction. 
either of the uh, past tensor or the past flacida. So, uh, along with retraction, look for mobility, right? Color of the tympanic membrane can be of various colors. So, uh, can be red in which all condition? A red color, red uh, tympanic membrane you will get in uh, acute otitis media. A bulging, red bulging uh, tympanic membrane. And also in bullous meringitis, it will be red in color. Or it can be a flamingo pink. Flamingo pink. Okay, it is actually the color of the uh, thigh region of the flamingo bird. Flamingo pink color in an active phase of autosclerosis and it is called the Schwartz sign. Okay, it is the uh, active uh, phase of autosclerosis. If you are seeing a flamingo pink color, uh, we call it as a Schwartz sign. Right? And there will be a waxy appearance. In which condition you get a waxy appearance? It is a typical of a secretory otitis media. Okay. And uh, chalky white. In which condition? Chalky white. You get a, a chalky white appearance in a tympanosclerosis. Okay. In tympanosclerosis. And in blue color. Blue color is usually we call it as a hemotympanum that is in a fracture causing a uh, bleeding into the uh, middle ear it will be reflected uh, as blue colored tympanic membrane so that is blue so these are the various colors uh, seen in uh, tympanic membrane red in case of a uh, bullous meningitis or an acute otitis media Flamingo pink or short sign in case of an active phase of water sclerosis. Then waxy, secretory otitis media, chalky white, tympanosclerosis and blue color in hemotym. Next is presence of perforation. Perforation means there is a, a, a defect or the a hole in the tympanic membrane. Okay, so if there is a perforation, you have to note the site, size, shape. Then the margins of the perforation and if you can see the middle ear mucosa through the perforation, comment on that also. And in all cases, tympanic membrane should be drawn both right and left. Even if it is a normal tympanic membrane, you should draw the tympanic membrane in your examination findings. Okay, so uh, this is which side? Right or left? This is right or left side? This is a right tympanic membrane. Is this normal or abnormal? This is abnormal. Isn't it? Why it is abnormal? Because there is no cone of light. Cone of light comes in which quadrant? It is in the andro inferior quadrant. And how can you divide the tympanic membrane into four quadrant? That I have already uh, told in uh, anatomy of tympanic membrane by two lines. One passing through the uh, parallel to the angle of malleus and another one perpendicular to the first line and passing through the umbo, isn't it? So, there is a perforation in the pass flaccida. Huh? If your perforation is here, this is called an attic perforation. Attic. Okay. The perforation is in the pass flaccida. We call it as an attic perforation. Okay. Attic. Right? And if the perforation is in the pass tensor, it can be in, in anywhere in the four quadrant. So, the perforations in the past tensor can be of two types. One, it can be a... This is a central perforation. Central. What is a central perforation? A central perforation is a perforation in the past tensor with remnants of tympanic membrane all around. A perforation in the past tensor with the remnants of tympanic membrane all around. All around. Okay. And if it is like this. What is this called? There is no remnants all around. Isn't it? This side there is no remnant. Here there is only the annulus. Then we call it as a marginal perforation. Right? Marginal. Okay. 
So, uh, an attic perforation, a center perforation, a marginal perforation. There are three types of, according to the site, there are three types. Okay, then what regarding the, what about the size of perforation? We look for the site only in case of central perforation. In case of attic or margin, we are not bothered about the size of perforation. If it is like this, this is a small central perforation. Okay, then if it is involving more than two quadrants, then it is a medium sized central perforation. So, if it involving only one quadrant, it is a small central perforation. If more than two quadrant or more than one quadrant, it is a medium sized perforation. And if the perforation is like this, involving all the four quadrant, we call it as a large central perforation or a subtotal perforation. Okay, large central, otherwise it's subtotal. So there are Size of, that is the size of perforation. Then shape of perforation of course. You can comment on whether it is. This is. What is the shape of this? It is a kidney shaped. Isn't it? So this is a large central perforation. Which is almost kidney shaped. Or it can be round. Or it can be an oval. Isn't it? Okay. Then regarding the margins. If you are getting a uh, traumatic perforation, after a trauma, the margins will be ragged edges. Ragged. See, irregular margins are characteristic of a traumatic perforation. Okay, this is trauma. And can be, sometimes it will be smooth margins. See, smooth margin. Isn't it? And in long standing cases, long standing chronic otitis media, what happens is that if this is your uh, tympanic membrane and this is your margin of the perforation, this squamous epithelium will go, go, go and it will go into the middle layer. So what will happen? The, there will be inrolling of the margins of the perforation. You can see that also. There will be, the margin will be smooth and it is rolled inwards, inwards towards the middle layer. So that also you can comment, right? So site, attic or uh, past tensor. In the past tensor, it is a central or a marginal perforation. And uh, regarding the size, can be a small central or it can be a moderate size perforation or can be a large central perforation or a subtotal perforation. And uh, shape, according to the shape though, then the margins can be an irregular edges in case of a traumatic perforation or it can be a smooth edges or smooth edges with the inrolling of the margins in a chronic otitis media, long standing perforations. What is the normal color of middle ear mucosa? If you are looking uh, into the middle ear and the uh, tympanic membrane is intact, then the color of the middle ear mucosa is bony white. Because you are seeing the medial wall. In the medial wall there is promontory and over the promontory there is single layer of cuboidal epithelium. So the promontory is a bone and the color of the bone is shining through the mucosa. So the color is termed as bony white in color. But if there is a perforation, what will happen? There will be um, irritation of the area and the blood vessels will uh, go more towards the area. There will be more of vascularity. So the color will uh, change permanently from bony white to different shades of red to pink in color. Right? So uh, if you are seeing the middle ear mucosa as pink or you can see the middle ear mucosa in active cases as reddish or it can be, it will be edematous if there is an uh, active infection or sometimes there will be discharge also uh, seen through a perforated, uh, through a perforation. Okay. So that also you have to write. And a common mistake made by the students is that uh, during examination the students will draw a uh, perforation here 
and along with that they will also draw a cone of red. This, is, this will never happen because once there is a perforation the normal anatomy or normal orientation of the tympanic membrane is lost and cone of light will not happen. So don't uh, draw like this. It shows that you never saw a uh, tympanic membrane and the uh, finding was told by someone. Okay. So there won't be a cone of light in a perforated tympanic membrane. Okay. And one more thing, sometime you will see a retraction pocket. Okay, that is a retraction pocket. And this retraction pockets are drawn as a dotted line. These retraction pockets are usually seen in the posterior superior quadrant of the uh, past tense. And they are drawn as a dotted line. And the question usually asked is, how will you differentiate between a retraction pocket and a perforation? Okay, in perforation there is a hole, there is a defect in the tympanic membrane. But in a retraction pocket there is no defect in the tympanic membrane. So how will you differentiate that? One thing, if there is a perforation, the mobility will be permanently absent. So one is mobility. mobility if we are looking for mobility there will there will not be uh, the tympanic membrane will not be mobile in case of a perforation okay it will be negative but in a retraction pocket it will be present except in a case of adhesive otitis media grade 4 there will be any mobility otherwise the retraction the retraction pocket will be mobile and second thing, you can see the middle ear mucosa through a perforation, but not in case of retraction pocket. So middle ear mucosa, visibility of middle ear mucosa uh, will be present in case of a perforation, but it will, will not be visible through a retraction pocket. And third, you can see the margins of the perforation. Margins of tympanic membrane can be seen in perforation, but there won't be any margins in a Retraction pocket. Margins. Margins will be present. In a retraction pocket, margins will be absent. And how will you confirm? Confirmation is by probing. Under, uh, auto, uh, under a microscope. Under an operating microscope, you can um, very gently probe the margins. And margins can be seen in case of perforation but margins won't be there in a case of uh, retraction pocket. Okay. Uh, the next is examination of facial now. Usually in case of uh, element facial palsy, lower motor neuron palsy, the both upper and the lower part of one side of face will be affected. Okay. So the, that is uh, one is wrinkling of the forehead. Ask the patient to wrinkle his forehead. It will be absent on the affected side. Then attempted closure. Ask the patient to close his eye and if there is facial nerve palsy, that side he will be, um, there will be inability to close the upper eyelid. And in attempted closure, the eyeball will roll upwards. Okay, the, there will be inability to close the eyelid and in case of an attempted closure, the eyeball will roll upwards. And that phenomena is called the Bell's phenomena and that sign is bell sign. Okay, the upward rolling of the eyeball on attempted closure in case of a facial nerve palsy, element facial nerve palsy is called the Bell's phenomenon. Bell's phenomena. Okay, and next is there will be uh, this nasolabial fold will be absent on the affected side. So there will be absence of wrinkling, then inability to close the eyelid and also Bell's phenomenon. Bell sign will be positive. And there will be absence of the nasolabial fold. And if you ask the patient to show the teeth, there will be deviation of the angle of mouth towards the normal side. Okay, deviation will be towards the normal side. And along with this, you have to do the topo diagnostic test. 
topo diagnostic test of facial nerve palsy that I will describe along with the facial nerve disorders. Okay. So, in the examination of facial nerve, and mainly in LML, lower motor neuron palsy, the whole upper and the lower part of one side of face on the affected side will be uh, examined. Wrinkling of forehead, closure of eyelid, then uh, nasolabial fold and also deviation of angle of mouth towards the normal side and topo diagnostic test. Okay. And after facial now, we have to assess the auditory component as well as the vestibular component. The auditory component is are the test of hearing. In OPD, we can assess the hearing by means of tuning fork test. That I will explain in after completion of the examination of ear. And the vestibular component assessed by one by the spontaneous nystagmus. Okay. And how will you assess the nystagmus for the patient? What is nystagmus? Nystagmus is an involuntary, rhythmical, regular, oscillatory movement of the eyeball. There are four adjectives. One is involuntary, that is not uh, on attempt, it is involuntary. It is regular and it is oscillatory and it is rhythmic movement of the eyeball. That is called nystagmus. So, involuntary, oscillatory, rhythmic and regular movement of the eyeball is called nystagmus. And how will you assess that? So, that is why that should be done in good light. You have to see the even the minute movement of the eyeball. So, in good light, patient seated in front of the examiner and the patient's head should be kept steady. Otherwise, what happens? When you move your uh, finger, the patient will move his head also. Like this. It's a common thing happening. So first you have to keep the patient set. One with one hand, keep the head of the patient steady. And ask the patient to move the eyeball. Or look at the tip of your finger. Okay. Patient seated in front of the examiner. Patient seated in front of the examiner and the patient is seated in front of the examiner. Right? And steady the head of the patient and ask the patient to follow the tip of your fingers. First turn the tip uh, finger to the right side. Then to the right side. Keep it there for a minimum period of one minute. Because in peripheral nystagmus there can be latency. It can happen after a latent period. So if you do like this, you will uh, fail to elicit this diagnosis. So you have to give some time, at least one minute of time for uh, provoking the nystagmus which is latent. Okay? So place the patient in front of, the, uh, front of you. Steady the head of the patient. Then ask the patient to follow the tip of your fingers. Then move it towards the right, left, towards the right at 30 degrees uh, from the midline. Don't go to the extremes. Okay. And when you reach the uh, one side, place it for a minimum of one minute to allow the elicitation of uh, latency. Okay. And also both sides in the horizontal plane and also vertical plane. And look for nystagmus. At the uh, next is the fistula test. So this uh, spontaneous nystagmus and fistula test is for the uh, examination of the vestibular component. Okay. And then uh, fistula test we are uh, looking for the nystagmus. That is why spontaneous nystagmus is done prior to fistula test. Okay. If there is a nystagmus, already there is a nystagmus. Otherwise, if you are not looking for that, the fistula test uh, data or the result will be misinterpreted. So, before doing a fistula test, you have to look for the presence of a spontaneous nystagmus. And what is this fistula test? It is a movement from the tympanic membrane will go through the ossicular chain and cause vibrations of the foot plate of status. 
and then it will go to the vibrations uh, of the bony labyrinth and the all mechanisms. So what is the fistula? Fistula is a tube with two ends open. Okay. So if there is a perforation of the demanding membrane here and if there is an erosion of the bony labyrinth the most commonest site of fistula is the lateral semicircular canal. So if there is an erosion here also if there is a fistula like this so there is perforation and also there is an erosion of the uh, most commonly the bony labyrinth. So if there is a pressure variation here it will be transmitted through this through this to the perilymph system. Isn't it? So what will happen? If you give a pressure difference in the external auditory canal, this will be transmitted through the fistula and the patient will, uh, will uh, have a giddiness along with nausea and vomiting and also there will be uh, nystagmus. Okay. So how will you elicit a fistula test? How will you do a fistula test? We are giving a positive and negative pressure to the external auditory canal by two methods. One, we are pressing on the travis. We are giving a pressure over the travis. Positive pressure, positive pressure in between negative pressure. Or we can use a single speculum. So speculum like this, to within there will be single bulb is attached. Okay. And either with a single speculum or by pressing over the travis. We are giving a positive, intermittent positive pressure is applied and if there is a fistula, the patient uh, will have giddiness, uh, nausea, vomiting and also there will be nystagmus. Okay, so and how will you interpret if it is positive? Positive fistula, there are two interpretations. One, your labyrinth is functioning. Okay, one, it is functioning. Second, there is presence of a fistula. And in which condition you get a fistula? The commonest condition which causes an ear fistula is a cholestatoma. So, there are two interpretations. One, labyrinth functioning and presence of cholestatoma. That is a tuberculosis. disease. Okay, these two. Presence of fistula caused by cholestatoma. Uh, These are the two interpretations. And if it is negative, a negative fistula. Actually there will be a fistula but we will get a negative. So what will you call it? It is a false negative fistula. There is a fistula but there is no giddiness, no nystagmus. In which condition? That is a dead labyrinth. Labyrinth is not at all functioning. It is a dead labyrinth. So, a false negative fistula is seen in dead labyrinth. Okay. And in some condition you get a false positive fistula. In a uh, false positive, there is actually there is no fistula but the test will be positive. So, uh, it is caused in conditions, all this will be normal. But in one condition, after stepidectomy or penetration operation. Okay. So, after stepidectomy or fenestration operation, you get a false positive fistula test. Second, endolymphatic hydrops due to any cause in many years or any condition which is causing an endolymphatic hydrops. Okay. Endolymphatic high drops due to any cause. And the third uh, is congenital syphilis. You get a uh, positive visceral test in congenital syphilis. Why? Because there is stapes uh, footprint <coughs> is hypermobile. Okay, there is uh, stapedian footplate is hypermobile in congenital syphilis, congenital syphilis. So, you will get a false positive test and that is called the Hennebert sign.
In one more condition you get a false positive and that is in eosinophilic granuloma. Okay, so this Fisler test is important. So Fisler test is done by giving in uh, alternative uh, pressure, positive pressure to the uh, external auditory canal either by pressing over the travis or by using a Seagull speculum. And if there is a fistula, the patient uh, will complain of uh, giddiness associated with nausea and vomiting and there will be presence of nystagmus. Okay. And a positive fistula, the interpretations are one, the labyrinth is functioning and second, there is presence of fistula most commonly due to a cold steatoma. And a false negative fistula is seen in a dead labyrinth and false positive fistula is, uh, is present in one is after stepidectomy or fenestration operation and uh, second after um, endolymphatic hydrops due to any cause, third in eosinophilic granuloma and fourth you get in uh, congenital syphilis due to hypermobile stapes and that is called the Henneberg sign and spontaneous nystagmus should be elicited before doing a fistula test and I already uh, told that this fistula test is, should be done towards the end of examination after ear and nose and throat at the end of examination only you have to do otherwise what will happen if the patient is having severe giddiness you won't be able to continue with your, with your examination. So, uh, it is better to do towards the end of ENT examination. Okay. After uh, test of hearing and the, that of vestibular function, we have to uh, look for any uh, signs of intracranial complications. They are, uh, look for uh, signs of raised intracranial tension, then test of cerebellar function and also examine the skull and the spine. Then only, the examination of ear will be complete. So to summarize, ear examination start with pinna, then your pre-auricular area, then the post-auricular area, external auditory canal, the tiger sign and the mastoid tenderness with your three finger test. Then uh, look for tympanic membrane for retraction, mobility, color, perforation and uh, color of medulla mucosa. Examination of facial now, tuniform test, spontaneous nystagmus, fistula uh, test, signs of raised intracranial tension, examination of cerebellar function and examination of skull and spine. Right?